Hello and welcome to the Friday, August 23rd, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. One issue that has baffled me for a while now is that we keep getting weblogs from our honeypots where the URL request that contains a string percent percent target percent percent. The rest of the URL usually follows patterns that we see when attackers are trying to determine the version of a WordPress server by looking at various theme files that are indicating particular versions. So I sort of wrote it off as, well, you know, just a broken scanning tool for WordPress, but looks like there's a little bit more to it. And Xavier was actually the one who kind of solved that by realizing that these requests are coming from IP addresses associated with OpenAI. Now, OpenAI, of course, is spidering the web in order to train its models, but this particular traffic wouldn't really make much sense because typically what you get back is, well, just some template file and they're requesting the same URLs over and over from various honeypots of ours. My best guess at this point is that this is probably related to OpenAI Actions, this feature that you can use in order to embed information from APIs in your open API prompts. And that is likely what is causing OpenAI to reach out to these URLs. Haven't quite worked it out yet, so in case someone has a little bit of experience uh, with these actions, it uh, would be nice uh, to get your take on uh, whether or not this could be used. Still doesn't explain the percent percent pattern. This looks like uh, some kind of template or such that failed to completely resolve. But either way, OpenAI or someone using OpenAI is scanning the internet and uh, turning OpenAI into some kind of vulnerability scanning tool. I also checked on the ChatGPT OpenAPI competitor Claude and uh, did see a couple of requests from them, but it's usually sort of one or two a day, if at all, while for OpenAPI, we easily get thousands a day. There is now also a new feature in our API that retrieves a list of all IP addresses that we have for OpenAPI, also the same for Anthropic, for Claude, but again, the list is very short for them. So if anybody has any more insight on this, uh, how these actions is actually could possibly be used, and that's really just a guess at this point, or why we are sort of left with that broken template, that percent percent pattern, uh, please let me know and uh, maybe can fill in some of the gaps here. And I think it was yesterday that I mentioned that some Linux systems, uh, dual boot systems, failed to boot after you applied the latest Windows update. We now have uh, some help here from Microsoft. Microsoft published a brief guide in its release health center where they're going over some of the things that you can do before applying the update or after you apply the update. Basically, once you notice that the Linux system is no longer bootable in order to save your system. And Google released yesterday an update for Chrome. This fixes one of those famous V8 type confusion issues that is already being exploited. The same issue also affects, of course, Microsoft Edge. Microsoft states that they're working on a fix, but a fix, as far as I know, has not yet been released. Should probably be released in the next couple of days. And security company Syngia is posting that they saw a recently patched Cisco vulnerability exploited before a patch was available. They're attributing this to what they call Velvet and a Chinese threat actor. The vulnerability itself is not really that terribly when you think about it. You first need to have admin access to the switch in order uh, to actually run the exploit. So what does the exploit actually do at this point? Well, it does give you access to the underlying Linux operating system, which you usually don't have access to even as an administrator and allows you to deploy more persistent malicious code. 
And Solar Winds releases an update to its help desk product. It fixes two critical vulnerabilities. One is a Java deserialization remote code execution vulnerability. And the second one is one of those backdoor vulnerabilities, or as it's often called, a hard-coded credential vulnerability. That is one where exploitation is probably extremely likely, given that it's all a matter of just figuring out what these credentials are. It's Friday again, and uh, I do have another science.edu student here to talk about his research. Uh, Chris, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, my name is Chris Ross. I recently just graduated from the master's program at SIN's uh, Technical Institution. I'm a cybersecurity consultant with 17 years of experience in IT and cybersecurity. And on my part-time job, I actually am in the National Guard in Vermont as a cyber warrant officer. Well, that's uh, quite a bit of stuff on your plate, but luckily, I guess uh, the master's degree work is behind you. Now, the last thing that you did was that research paper, and you picked up a real timely topic, memory safe languages. Uh, Can you explain a little bit uh, what your research was about? Of course. Uh, So I don't have a really strong programming um, background, but, you know, I kind of, my strengths are more vulnerability management, incident response, and threat hunting. So Uh, I took a topic that was released in February, which was actually around the time I started my research paper. The White House and the Office of National Cyber um, released an article pushing the industry to to move towards memory-safe programming languages as the architecture of the programming language is more secure than non-memory-safe. The issues with non-memory-safe bounds control and and memory leakage uh, is remediated with memory safe programming languages. Um, I took a different avenue approach to see how these two different languages um, actually impacted the industry with vulnerabilities such in product solutions, operating systems, et cetera. Because it's not just about memory safety or there are a lot of other vulnerabilities that are not really related uh, to memory safety. Can you explain a little bit what your approach here was? Every business, every school, we all have tools, right? They're all built with something, some type of language, whether it be memory safe or non-memory safe. I wanted to see how those tools could be exploited by, you know, attackers and or just, you know, runtime errors or issues or things that could um, produce vulnerabilities, right? So I took the National Vulnerability Database and I did a five-year term from January 2019 to this year, April uh, 24. And I, you know, had a subset of non-memory safe and memory safe uh, programming languages. And what I did from there was I kind of, I did a, I created a script to do an API pool, uh, downloaded all of the national vulnerability databases, vulnerability findings, and then parsed out these languages um, and then compared kind of results in the findings of how many vulnerabilities currently in, in the industry and environments out there with, you know, businesses and government and all that stuff. Um, and kind of did a side by side comparison of, of what's out there and, and also the total volume. What language do you focus on here? Uh, so the languages I picked were C and C++. And then for um, memory safe languages, I did Python, JavaScript, um, Golang, C Sharp, and Ruby. Okay. Uh, did you not include Rust because it's too new or? Um, I didn't include Rust, not necessarily because it was too new. I just, those were the five I picked. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of wish I wanted to put Rust in there. Uh, I also wanted to do assembly, but I also had to kind of narrow my scope. I only had three months to do this. So um, I kind of just, those were kind of the ones I went with. Yeah. yeah. So those are sort of more common ones. I think there's also not really that much software yet written in Rust compared to these other languages uh, right. that you have. Uh, did you somehow, were you able to adjust for like you know, how much software exists in these languages or was it really just comparing the total number of vulnerabilities? It was comparing the vulnerabilities um, and the, the exploits available currently with those mm-hmm. vulnerabilities. Um, again, I don't have a super strong programming background, so I kind of just took my strengths, which is looking at vulnerabilities, total volume, uh, exploit ability. Um, if there's currently things out there that can take these and actually run them and do them, um, or things that could possibly be on the dark web that uh, are being passed around by attackers. Yeah, so uh, can you quickly summarize what's of the results were? Sure. 
Uh, so they were not what I was expecting. Um, when I, my initial response to this was non-memory safe due to it being, you know, uh, viewed less secure was going to have a lot more vulnerabilities tied to it, um, than not a uh, memory safe. That was not the case actually. Um, for the five year span that I did, uh, C actually only had three medium, uh, vulnerabilities and C plus plus had five highs and one, one medium. Um, the average severity score is around a 6.5 on the CVSS 3.1 scale. And were those vulnerabilities actually memory safety issues or were there other issues? They, they were, they had a mix. Um, so the commonality between the two that I found was buffer overflows, memory leaks, and arbitrary code execution. And that was kind of the highlight through my presentation, through my paper, was to, to show the relation on those three things as those are kind of the common um, denominators between mm -hmm. the two. Yeah, and uh, any idea if also not the legacy software was of a little bit an issue here? Did you take a look at how old the software is that was vulnerable or? I, I didn't necessarily look at the software. Again, I pulled from uh, you know the five-year period. So those vulnerabilities had to be found within that period. Um, usually with the older stuff, vulnerabilities aren't necessarily found more recent, especially with a language that's been around for 30 plus years. Um, I didn't have time to necessarily dig into that. Uh, but again, in my paper, I have additional research topics to do more research on this. Um, but that is that is not something I considered. So that, that there you go. Yeah. Now we have something else to look yeah. into. <laughs> yeah, so there's always more research that can be done. Exactly. And uh, what about the exploitability of these vulnerabilities? Um, a lot of them had a pretty ease of use to, to exploit. Um, again, you know, uh, I guess once you're in a system, anything's possible, right? But yeah. a lot of a lot of the flaws with the memory safe were, you know. Uh, version controls, right? Uh, a version got released that had a bunch of vulnerabilities tied to it that were easily executable. Something within the software development chain must have got overlooked and the quality checks didn't, you know, parse through the, the security checks like they should have. I know that's kind of a common um, trend, right? Everyone's trying yeah. to push to production and, and get the updates fixed or the bugs fixed, um, which then creates more bugs, right? The speed to development, uh, do you think it's actually a bit verse in some of the you know scripting languages like javascript python uh, you know i sort of have to feel at least as a developer myself i did see way back in the day and you're just the process of compiling and such i think makes you almost a little bit more careful because you don't want to mm -hmm. waste time compiling code that doesn't work any thing you saw in the data or was this really not that obvious so from a perspective of you know uh, risks right from the vulnerabilities yes. java and python actually for memory safe were the two highest um vulnerable languages right they're yes. also very commonly used so they, they have a lot of application and they're in a lot of environments so that's part of the contribution to it right um but the the thing that i thought was you know the the big takeaway here was that they had the same type of vulnerabilities within Java and Python as C and C++ did, mm -hmm. even though they're supposed to be a more secure um, programming language, right? So yeah, they had yeah. common types of attacks with you know the buffer overflows, memory leaks, and arbitrary code execution. Same and arbitrary code execution. I remember, I think it was earlier this year, there was this vulnerability uh, that you know where languages didn't properly encode arguments as they send them like to the exec uh, system call to execute uh, operating system commands. The big headline there was, hey, you know, arbitrary code execution in Rust. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it really sort of more or less affected all languages. It was not at all memory safety. It was just uh, a basic sort of output encoding issue uh, that uh, was actually not easy to solve. But uh, yeah, so anything, what's next for you now since you're done with the program? So I, I love education, right? I love to continuously learn. Um, I am probably, so I am starting a SANS course uh, in about a month actually for cloud, but um, I am thinking about going for the uh, graduate certificate for cloud. Um, and then after that, probably leadership as I move up in my role, I'm yeah. trying to get more into that leadership and change security culture. And then also, you know, be a part of the 
the supply chain and the software development and being able to write out these programs and how they should function and how they operate within a business. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so thanks for joining me here and a link to the paper will be in the show notes. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for recommending this podcast to friends and enemies and pets. And talk to you again on Monday.